You know, this might look like a hologram tutorial where we track Gandalf in between my fingers, and you know what, maybe you fell for that, but uh, in reality, this is just gonna be kind of like a tutorial about corner pinning, planar tracking, and combining that with compositing. So really, uh, this is a workflow tutorial that just happens to have Gandalf smoking a pipe in it, um, just because uh, why not? So uh, in this tutorial, you're gonna learn about, again, planar tracking, so how to do this nice tracking, and then how to do the rest of the overlaying and compositing with a couple of nodes. So without further ado, I guess we better get into it. So new Blender project, I'm using 2.91 beta uh, because I'm too lazy to, <laughs> uh, to update to 2.91 that's actually out uh, at the present, but whatever. Um, so with a new Blender project open, you're also going to need some footage uh, for tracking. So uh, I'm going to be using uh, this footage again. Uh, I just want to mention it quickly. Um, if you are part of the Patreon, uh, if you're a patron, that, that's probably a better way to say it, um, you have access to this footage. Otherwise, just film yourself having four dots on each finger or, you know, whatever. I mean, this, <laughs> this isn't really the correct way to do a hologram anyways. You want a piece of glass or maybe a green screen, but whatever. Uh, we go with what we got. So... With Blender open, go to the movie clip editor because again, the first uh, step in a process like this where we need to do, you know, the compositing and tracking and all this is of course tracking our four dots. So a uh, quick trick is if you take your footage and just drag and drop, uh, Blender knows how to import that, which is pretty cool. And of course we can't just start tracking right away because everything is awry. Now, nothing's where it's supposed to be. For example, uh, the frame rate is 59.94 frames per second. So essentially 60 frames per second. We need to make sure that our project frame rate is also set to that. Um, long time viewers will also know render tab, color management, set that to standard. I'm so tired of saying it, uh, but you need to do that. Otherwise the view transform is gonna look weird. So again, filmic and then standard. It's just gonna change the color to be what we want it to be. And then other than that, I guess we just need to trim the footage because of course I hit record and then you know just stood there for a bit. So I'm just gonna find where the beginning of this clip is. So I raise my hands about here. So we can have it start on frame 170 and then equally or equal but opposite. I don't know what Newton would say about this. Uh, we need to find the last frame. So I close my hands and then pull them away. Um, and notice this isn't necessarily like, I'm not saying this is the frame where we can no longer see the trackers, right? I've already closed my hands and stuff like that. Um, I'm just saying this is where I want the footage to stop. The trackers, of course, need to stop uh, earlier uh, before my hands close. Okay. Cool, so now that we have everything set up with our in and out point, just hit prefetch so that everything is loaded into memory. Um, it takes longer to do this uh, with a video than an image sequence, I find. And there you go, the video is now loaded into memory. I actually had to restart Blender because this process is so broken, but whatever, moving on. Let's actually go full screen. Uh, now that we have our video in memory, next step is just tracking these dots, which of course, again, is not gonna begin from the first frame because trackers don't exist. So let's find the frame where we want this to begin. So maybe like, I don't know. Let's start here um, to track, pretty simple. I'm gonna enable normalize so lighting conditions are in some sense invariant or really doesn't account for changes in lighting, which means that it's gonna hold on to the tracker for longer. And then we just gotta, you know, do the tracking. So control click. And now in my experience, since I already did this shot, this is gonna have quite a bit of motion blur. So hopefully it works out, control T. Um, so made it through most of the footage. Of course, at some point we do need it to end. We could have it end early here, control L to lock. Um, yeah, so some footage has a lot of motion blur. Some of it's very out of focus. For example, this one is. Um, so you're probably gonna see a lot of manual tracker cleanup, but that's fine. Uh, second tracker, again, for this process to work uh, with the corner pinning and all that, make sure you have four trackers. If I didn't already specify that, I feel like that should be obvious, but whatever. Um, we could have it go one more frame just so it matches. So we could just add another keyframe and then we'll keep tracking, lock that. Um, okay, we got two more, super simple. Find the first frame. I mean, again, <laughs> recommendation, maybe film uh, footage that's in focus, just an idea. And that messes up near the end, but we can actually remove all this information past this point. Okay, lock that tracker, one more to go, and then we can get to the compositing step. It really doesn't take too long, uh, which is the nice thing. I'm gonna put a tracker here. I guarantee this is not gonna work very well. Okay, so it's holding on. This point, I probably wanna update it. So just add a new keyframe. Wait for it to move. Now it's very visible. Add another keyframe, control T. Okay, how far did it make it? Made it near the end. I know, tracking stimulating. There's nothing I can do about it, okay? If I could reinvent uh, tracking to be entertaining, you bet I would. Okay, 
Cool. Um, so once you have your four trackers, again, not for necessarily the whole shot, but at least for part of it, uh, we need to turn this into a planar track so that uh, we can have an image kind of go in this trapezoid or quadrilateral, you know, whatever it is at that moment. So go to solve, go to plane track, and then with all your trackers selected, so A to select all four of them, create a plane track, okay? Uh, this is just gonna make a rectangle on whatever frame you're on. That's, you're thinking, okay, what's the point? Uh, the point is it actually moves um, as if these four trackers were on a single surface or plane. That's why it's called a planar tracker. Um, it moves as if it's on that surface. And of course we need to do some adjustment, but you can see uh, this is the general idea. Um, so on any frame, what we wanna do is Alt A to deselect and then just like move this uh, into position. Um, just an just interesting thought, uh, this planar tracker that we're defining the corners of right now, um, it can be placed anywhere. It doesn't necessarily need to have the corners on the trackers. We're just doing that because it makes sense in this case. Um, but you could really put them anywhere, which is kind of the powerful thing about it. But you can see uh, now we have kind of like my fingers uh, stretching this rectangle in some sense, which is what we want. Okay, cool. Um, now that we are done with tracking, we are moving on to compositing, which is much uh, simpler. Maybe, maybe in uh, practice, but in theory, it's a bit tricky. Uh, so first of all, we need to see our footage. Again, we're just going to be doing a bunch of compositing as if uh, we were in After Effects or DaVinci or whatever it is. Import in your footage, and we're going to put it through a viewer note so we can actually see what's going on. And you can see that this is actually just dis extracting uh, the footage from the uh, layout workspace, which is important because... Um, we're gonna be using some nodes that have that involved in a moment. But um, point is, you can see this is updating after a lot of time uh, for each frame, because again, it's just pulling from the video from the Layout Workspace Movie Clip Editor. Uh, first thing we wanna do is overlay an image over this rectangle. To do this, we are gonna use a node called the Plane Track Deform. And again, you can see right now, this doesn't have anything in it. And this is the point I was talking about. Um, the track, the pointer track is inherent uh, to the footage in the movie clip editor. So we need to pick the footage that we tracked. In there, we need to pick the camera that we used and in there, the plane track that we used. Um, in other words, these are connected. If I was to like take this plane track and rename it to, uh, to something else, uh, to like, I don't know, Gandalf, because I guess that's what we're gonna do with it. Uh, now in the compositing workspace, you're gonna see this is not valid because we need to pick uh, the, the correct one. Um, cool thing about this is it updates. So this is just kind of like the uh, silhouette of the rectangle at wherever it may be at that point. We also get an alpha and we also get free motion blur calculation based on the movement of those four corners because of course it could calculate motion blur. Uh, we get all those things, but uh, we don't just want like a white or black rectangle. What we want is our image. So. Uh, just like last time, to import something in, you can just drag and drop. That includes a uh, Gandalf photo from the first movie. I don't know. Well, was it Return of the Jedi? <laughs> I'm just memeing. Um, take this image, plug it in here, and you're going to see that it takes this image and basically corner pins it so it's kind of locked in there. So you can think of this as a corner uh, pinning kind of transformation, even though there actually is a corner pin node. Um, it's just that these four corners are pulling from the tracker data, which means you could actually do it manually uh, if you load in the track positions, um, but we don't need to, okay? Um, so now we have a image that moves with our planar track and the original footage. We wanna put one on top of the other and an easy way to do that, alpha over, Nope, not that, not alpha convert, almost the same, except not at all. Alpha over, we're gonna put our footage in the background, which is the top node, and our image that's being deformed in the foreground, uh, so that when we view this, uh, you can see uh, now everything is moving uh, correctly, at least until you know that we stop tracking in the first part and the last part, okay? Um, so now how do we make this look at least passable? First of all, I don't like this idea of the Gandalf V and Alt V, by the way, to zoom in and out. I don't like this idea of uh, Gandalf literally touching the uh, corners, like the fingertips, stay away, you know what I mean? Um, instead, what we wanna do is scale it down a bit, right? And you're thinking, oh, you know, pretty simple. You take this, you take a um, transform node, and then you scale it down just a bit. So let's say like 0.9, um, and you might think that works, but um, it actually takes this and scales it down from the middle. So like if we go to a random frame, it might not necessarily look that good, right? At the distance between each of these fingertips isn't perfect. In this case, it's not too bad because I keep my fingers near the middle, uh, but this is the incorrect order of operations. Instead, what you wanna do is take this image uh, from the get-go, then scale it down and then send it through the uh, planar track to form. And I'll show you what I mean. So we're gonna use a transform node, same setup as last time. Uh, but this time we can use 0.9 or something like that. Um, so you can see really what we're doing is we're taking a scaled down version. So this is before 
and this is after. We're scaling it down, uh, weaving it through the plane track to form so that some of the perimeter um, is essentially transparent, right? And this is like a nice procedural way to work where we can change this value at any point. Uh, speaking of which, we need this to actually emerge and disappear. So on this frame, you can see this is where we begin our track. Uh, so on this frame, I'm gonna set this to zero so it's not there. And then let's go 10 frames down to 220, make it a scale of whatever it was, like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, you could play around with it. Um, I'm thinking 0.85 maybe. Just so there's a good amount of distance, we're gonna keyframe it. So again, uh, even though the tracking's still happening, it's gonna take uh, 10 frames for it to go from small to very big. Um, and again, it can calculate for this motion blur and everything like that, which is cool. Uh, we wanna do the same thing at the out point. So we need to find the last frame where we're tracking at least all four of them, which I guess is this one, I think, although this kind of looks like a null tracker, uh, but whatever, we'll work with it, it's fine. Uh, for this one, we are going to keyframe zero since we want it to be fully gone, and then 10 frames before, essentially just the opposite uh, operation, we're gonna set it to the same value, 0.85, and then keyframe, okay? Uh, so now we get, have it getting bigger and then remaining at 0.85, and then at the end it disappears. Okay, cool. Uh, to make this look a bit better, uh, more stuff before we do the planar track um, deform, deformation, whatever. Uh, first of all, let's first of all make, what, first of all, it's first of all. That's a bit repetitive. Uh, let's make it kind of like a blue tint. So I'm just gonna mix this with, and I guess, I guess we'll also need to deal with the alpha, but first of all, let's set this to add. I'm gonna mix this with kind of like a bluish color, kind of hologrammy, uh, something like that. And we don't want the factor to be one. In fact, we want uh, the factor to be kind of dependent on where this image is. Um, so again, what, what I'm trying to say is you can see the perimeter is also being mixed even though we scaled it down. Um, so we just need to extract the alpha channel from this uh, one right here. Um, you can do that with the separate RGBA, which gives us the red, uh, green, blue, and most importantly, alpha channel, which has this rectangle inset uh, inside of here. So we can just put that right there and you're gonna see that it's still gonna be like overwhelmingly blue, uh, but at least it's not everywhere anymore. So again, this is before, uh, it's too, oh wait, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that this is before Nope, I guess it just pulls the alpha immediately. This is before, there we go, and this is after. So I guess I didn't know that. You could just pull this in immediately. Although I do think it takes the red factor when it does that. So I guess it is better to do alpha channel. Um, also to make this less intense, math right here, set it to multiply by like, I don't know, point 0.2 or something. Uh, just so it's only 20% effective, but it's still changing the color a bit. Next thing I want to do, and it's kind of like the most important thing, is adding a bit of glare or glow or blur, uh, just so this kind of looks kind of like this glowing entity. Um, and to do that, we want to add in a blur is the way I'm going to do it. So after, this time after the planar track deform, um, I'll show you what happens if we don't. First of all, uh, we're going to add in a blur. So this is going to be our kind of fog glow version. And then we put like one on top of the other. This is going to be the setup where the blur is going to be set to like, I don't know, 100 or something. Uh, you're gonna see that when we do this, we kind of get the correct effect, but again, it's limited by the perimeter of this uh, planar track deform, so it's, it has to stay within the region, right? Um, so we do want this setup, just not uh, here. So this is why order of operations matters a lot, what comes before and after the uh, plane track deform. Um, so again, what you do is you just blur right there, and then we add, so mix mode set to add again because we're adding light in some sense. And now we wanna take this uh, blur node and actually increase the amount of blurring. So again, it's uh, blurring our plain track deformed uh, Gandalf. And of course, uh, just like last time, we take the original unblurred version, put that in the background, okay? Um, so again, what we're getting right here is the original uh, going in the background, and then we're taking a blurred out version and just uh, slapping it on top. And by the way, we can make the blur more intense uh, just like that. Um, just to make this look a bit more hologrammy, a couple more tricks. First of all, shouldn't be complete, uh, completely opaque what we're sending through here, the glowed uh, version. Uh, maybe set it's like 0.75 or something like that, just so it's a bit see-through and you can play around with this. But um, also a great trick is if this hologram distorts kind of like the footage under it, that's just gonna help sell the effect a bit more. So uh, to do this, super simple, displace node, that this is exactly what it's for. Uh, so we're taking our original footage and we are going to displace it by what? Um, by, I guess you could either do the blurred out version or I guess the one that isn't blurred out. I'm gonna go for the one that isn't. Um, use that for the displacement vector and then make that a bit stronger. And you'll see what that does in a second. 
Um, so you can see what this is doing is it's taking the footage and wherever this rectangle exists, it's going uh, to distort the footage kind of like with the edges and like color data based off of Gandalf, right? And you can make that more or less intense. And this updates uh, with whatever we do. Um, so we have this displaced footage. We're going to slap the uh, glowed version on top of this. Um, again, with some kind of factor not equal to one, maybe even 50% transparency. Uh, so it's very see-through. And you can see there's a tiny bit of difference uh, with and without this displace. Um, it just adds a bit of something. But in general, I mean, this is kind of like the uh, node network I'd use. Of course, I'd play around with this a bit more, like make the blue a little less intense uh, so we can get some of our original color back. You could do some feathering. Uh, you could do some pixelation, stuff like that. But in general, this is how you kind of go from, you know, tracking workspace, doing the planar tracker, uh, bringing it into compositing, and especially the idea of what goes before and after the planar track deform, uh, because again, order of operations matters. So again, this isn't like, you know, the best effect in the world. It's really just kind of like to illustrate a point, And I just kind of want to have this playing in the background while I talk about this. It's just kind of like to illustrate a point that the workflow is super easy, right? Motion blur is calculated for you. And as long as you do the tracking, everything else kind of falls into place. So if you enjoyed this tutorial, I mean, I guess that's a good thing. I don't know what I meant to say by that, but I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. And as always, at the end of the tutorial, I like to talk about the Patreon so it's not kind of invasive in the uh, beginning of the tutorial. I wonder if I can set this to repeat. Um, but yeah, Patreon exists. You can get the blend file for this with the original footage just so you can play around with this. Um, that exists on Patreon as well as all other blends I've ever uploaded. So if you become a patron, you get access to like 100 to 200, if not more, uh, blend files I've uploaded in the past. And of course, you get ones in the future. Additionally, exclusive tutorials, those are not on the CG Matter or Default Cube channels. Uh, they're just for patrons. Um, there's behind the scenes access, early access, access if I can upload a, vid a video early um, every once in a while, um, Discord benefits, stuff like that. So um, if this is something you're interested in, and of course you don't need to do it, but 560 to 570, and now I think even more, maybe we're closer to 580, uh, some patrons, uh, patrons are. Um, so I want to thank all those uh, patrons for single-handedly as a group um, keeping this channel afloat. I really appreciate it, and I hope uh, the benefits you're getting, whatever those are, depending on your tier, are worth it. Um, but I just wanted to credit you at the end of the tutorial because um, you're kind of like the directors or producers. There's, there's a word for this, of the show. Um, so you deserve credit. So thank you for watching this tutorial, everybody, patrons and non-patrons alike. I hope you learned something, and that's the show. See ya.